So, uh, good afternoon. It is good afternoon, just about by 60 seconds. Today, I hope to uh, provide you with confidence that o r itself is indeed ready for innovation in the industry, and that it is also itself seeking to modernise to improve its effectiveness and preparedness for the future. The technology advances that will take place and the opportunities that this will present to both yourselves and o r However, Before I take a look forward at what this means, forgive me, but I'd like to briefly look over my shoulder and behind us to see what's happened over the last 12 months or so. I think it's worthwhile reflecting on some of the work that we have done and you've contributed to as well in a big way, that recently done and sets our regular approach in context. I think the first point on there is highlighting the tangible progress that is continuing at Sellafield. Um, An example again of our enabling regulation and how we've worked with industry, Sellafield, NDA and such like to further progress towards uh, remediation of the, pol- the, pa- the piles, uh, the ponds, the silos and also the stack uh, that uh, Joanne highlighted uh, earlier on when she spoke. The transport of the largest inventory of exotic material from d u n r e y to Sellafield, a major achievement for the UK. That required ONR to work across its purposes of safety, security and transport, something that we don't always do and haven't always done to best effect. It required novel solutions to quite difficult challenges in that respect. And then also, uh, very similar, the safe return of a significant amount of material to the United States, again requiring us to work across our purposes. but also to work across multinational boundaries as well with government and with duty holders, <coughs> duty holders and licensees in the UK. We also permissioned the first nuclear concrete port at Hinkley Point C, a significant piece of work for us in terms of our assessment of the submissions that were provided to us by the licensee at Hinkley Point. And then quite a big piece of work that industry and ourselves are focused on now and will be for some time in the future is about developing nuclear site security plans that are now SIAPS compliant, uh, so aligning with our goal-setting security regime that we're looking to introduce in the UK. And the first nuclear site security plans have now been approved by my team in that regard. But that requires to work closely with industry, supporting them and likewise them feeding back to us about what the needs are in these areas. Bradwell itself has moved into a current maintenance period and that required a great deal of collaboration and cooperation across ONR, NDA and Magnox themselves. And then we have the Chinese entry into step three of the generic design assessment. The generic design assessment process itself is something that we've developed to give some certainty and some clarity to interested vendors coming to the UK about what they can expect with regards to regulatory assessment and regulatory engagement. And it's good progress there for the HPR 1000. And then, last but not least on that uh, list of bullets there, is making sure that we continue to have safe and secure operations across the industry. And that has been maintained and continues to be maintained in the future, hopefully. But why highlight enabling? Believe it or not, the enabling approach is innovative. It's interesting to note that many... Operators, even a number in the UK, and fellow national regulators across the world, it's a new concept and it's difficult to get to grips with. The term collaboration and cooperation associated with regulation and enabling is not in common use and many regulators are uncomfortable using them and question the appropriateness of those terms. What I would highlight is it required a significant cultural shift in o n r and our inspectors to make sure that they become aligned with the concept and principles behind enabling. But I would also highlight uh, as well examples of balanced and proportionate enforcement, letters that we've had to write to influence some improvements, improvement notice increasing our uh, leverage, shall we say, within duty holders, and include directions under the licence conditions, and in a number of instances also prosecutions. What I would say is enforcement is one of our tools. If we need to take strong enforcement action though, from my perspective and I know my inspectors, it's disappointing. What that indicates is that my teams and those of many of your, you here today, your teams, they've failed. 
in what they're seeking to do. And it would also appear to highlight a move away from enabling regulation. But I'd like to make the case that a balanced regulator willing to work with industry to achieve common outcomes, but who is also willing to act in a proportionate but necessarily robust and independent manner, trying to influence the right improvements and outcomes against safety and security shortfalls, instills stakeholder confidence and is actually good for the industry. I'd also like to take the opportunity in the conference today to highlight that we will continue to have a policy of openness and transparency. So later this year, you will see hitting the streets, signed copies will be available, it will be my inaugural CNI's report on the performance of the industry across safety, security and safeguards. It's been developed over the last few months by my team. It will be issued uh, in October of this year. But again, we're pursuing a policy of no surprises. The draft was shared with the Safety Directors Forum just last week, and there's a period of discussion and engagement with various stakeholders to make sure that uh, we are not surprising anyone at all across the industry with regards to the positions that we take and are able to justify them appropriately. I'll just give you a short video now with regards to enabling regulation and some perspectives of others. A few years ago, we had a plan for how we were going to retrieve from here, but we didn't have a solution. Everybody wanted perfection, and we couldn't deliver perfection. Then we all sat together under the offices of G6 and decided what we all want is to get rid of this hazard as quickly and as safely as possible. So how do we all collaborate to achieve that outcome? Not only have we achieved it with a plan that we can execute now, we're achieving it ahead of any schedule we anticipate was possible. So here we are, just ahead of active commissioning. Here we are, just ahead of our first retrievals. And it's one of many activities on site for which we've benefited from collaboration with our regulators and our other stakeholders. So what you heard there were two different perspectives uh, from a regulator and from a, a licensee, Paul Foster up at Stellarfield, but talking about enabling regulation, but with very much aligned views of what it is about and what it's trying to achieve. So, ONR helping to shape the future of the sector. People have mentioned this morning the nuclear sector deal already. It was launched 12 months ago or so now, and it recognises nuclear energy and the potential role it's got to play in future low carbon economy of the UK. But it emphasises the need to be cost effective. And it also it highlights the important role that regulators have and the need to ensure the effectiveness of the regulatory framework in the context of the changing environment and the changing practices that you will look to introduce across the industry. It presents a real opportunity for industry but requires leadership and drive. As indicated, it's essential to be cost effective and be able to deliver the certainty across the industry, be it new build, the operating reactor fleet, decommissioning and waste management. But in this, I do include the defence sector as well. Innovation can help and will have an important role, as regulators will as well. And myself and the team at ONR recognise the need to support industry to minimise regulatory uncertainty around innovation, which will facilitate its deployment and the benefits that this brings. Many are aware of the Energy Technology Institute's Nuclear Cost Drivers Project. Highlights a number of factors impacting the costs of nuclear. And it's not just new build, it focuses on all aspects of nuclear. But it highlights eight areas that industry should focus on to reduce project costs and risks. It's common sense when you actually read it. Not particularly innovative, but it still appears difficult to achieve. They, incomplete, they include completing plant design prior to starting construction. Now that's a novel idea. Developing multiple units at a single site or fleet deployment. Again, another good idea. Other things around adopting contracting model best practices, alignment with labour around nuclear projects, and others touching on maximising and incentivising learning. We seem to keep on learning the same lessons over and over again. The role of government in financing, mentioned by Joanna earlier, and adopting cost reduction measures. But importantly for ourselves, a key aspect highlighted 
is the need to transform regulatory interaction to focus on cost-effective delivery. I hope that today I and other speakers are able to provide confidence that we are very much focused on this issue, as indeed are the fellow national regulators across the globe and also indicated by Romina, Romina earlier. We believe that the goal-setting regulatory approach that we work with in the UK provides a high degree of flexibility for you and the supply chain as well to work within. It's technology neutral and does not seek to prescribe design solutions. It gives you an envelope for you to work within. Being outcome folk focused, it should allow sufficient space for you to pursue and optimise design solutions and consider these approaches that may be ver very well be novel, out with normal accepted practice, but also recognising that innovation can be applied in many areas, not just technical design solutions, and I'll touch on some of those in, in a second. As indicated, we are establishing a proven heritage around enabling, but there are other improvements we can make to enhance opportunities to realise the benefits of new approaches around the reduction of project costs and risks. Our corporate plan for 2019-20 includes a commitment to, to develop and publish ONR's own innovation plan. This will set out what we will do to regulate and enable innovation across the industry, but also where we are seeking to be innovative as a regulator ourselves. So it's not just about the innovation yourselves are looking to introduce, but what we can do to stimulate innovation within our own organisation. It will recognise the need for us to change our approach in many areas. We'll have to consider different ways of regulating, seek to learn from other industrial sectors and work more closely with industry, government and internationally on horizon scanning to ensure that we are well placed to contribute and regulate the effective deployment of innovative solutions. Now everybody talks about innovation, but what do we mean by it? It can be defined in many ways, but basically I believe it's about new or creative ideas that deliver benefits to any part of the nuclear life cycle. This can involve many things. The adoption of pioneering or novel technology. Many examples of this are coming to the fore that we've had to consider and have worked with industry to achieve mutually agreed outcomes. We've completed high-level technical assessments of reactor designs under the Advanced Nuclear Technology Banner. Literally just completed those over the last couple of weeks. And that will inform the UK's future considerations around advanced nuclear technologies. We've also agreed to the use, perhaps a little bit, uh, 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 unfortunately, explosively operated squib valves for use on the AP1000 reactor. So explosively operated valves. We've also looked at the need to increase digitisation across the industry. The use of PLCs around 20 years ago was heresy. I remember post office relays being the mantra that you've got to install on reactors. But obsolescence has driven, driven change there. There's also a recognition that pioneering for nuclear may not necessarily be pioneering for other sectors. Romina gave an indication of that earlier. Fly-by-wire planes, they're in the sky all the time. Yes, there are failures, but that's an example of innovation introduced in another sector. There's much to learn for all of us. To make innovation a reality, it's essential that we develop our engagement with you and your supply chain. Essential to ensure that potential solutions are not stifled at the OSEC because of ill-founded perceptions of what our position would be, and to ensure that we are ourselves well prepared and well informed. Involvement in the early concept stage will enable us to provide input at a much more meaningful and effective point, before major expense has been incurred and committed, allowing us to advise reg to red lines, because we will have some, that will allow optimum design development and prevent nugatory work on your part. It will also ensure my teams are able to properly develop their own understanding and consider the need for a change in regulatory approach, which will secure the necessary confidences and assurances, which may entail a review of the regulatory framework for whatever reason. Capturing storage and analysis of large volumes of data is providing great insights for other industrial sectors, such as aviation, road and rail. 
there may be similar opportunities for nuclear. Probably not to the same extent of terabyte scale uh, information coming to the fore. But could such work elsewhere provide insights for the nuclear industry? And we are looking at how we consider this and adapt it as a regulator. A prime example of non-technical innovation is our engagement with government and Ofgem and others on the funding model for new build, again mentioned previously, specifically the regulated asset-based model. Early engagement is helping to develop our thinking regarding the role that we will have to fulfil and how we need to position ourselves to support government and industry ambitions in this area. A recent example of successful enabling regulation in the EGRs was working together with ONR following some unexpected inspection findings on peripheral graphite blocks at Torness and Haitian 2. Both organisations recognised the issue. There was initially a difference of technical opinion on the perceived consequences. Innovative inspection techniques were deployed to gather further information and by considering the risk factors holistically, we were able to agree the return to service of the reactors whilst in parallel the detailed analysis and a longer term safety case was developed and agreed. Ultimately a genuine win-win for both organisations. Our approach to this emergent issue was to make sure we didn't allow perfection to be the enemy of the good while still maintaining our fundamental nuclear safety principles. We uh, knew that technical uncertainty would remain for some time so uh, we then focused on what we needed to do for return to service of the reactor and what could wait. We sought and obtained a commitment from EDF to have an interim outage, but then we worked to ensure that that wasn't necessary. The outcome was that we uh, ensured safe and timely return to service of one of the Torness reactors. So our approach is founded on a number of principles. Oh, yeah. uh, enabling and accessible. So working in an enabling manner, but making sure that we are accessible, but focusing on outcomes and solutions and looking to be available to ensure that we can work with you to develop solutions to challenges and problems that arise. But being collaborative as well with licensees, duty holders and other stakeholders. That, again, to achieve the agreed set of common outcomes. But that collaborative working also extends to doing international collaboration where we can become aware of ideas in other countries across the world and the solutions that they have developed to innovation. Being adaptable and agile, being responsive to the changing needs, mentioned I think by every speaker this morning. The needs of government, the expectations of industry and the changes in the environment. Adrienne mentioned strategic communications earlier and we're continually seeking ways of improving what we can do to inform our wider stakeholder community to make sure that they are aware of what our expectations are. Horizon scanning. It's essential if we are to keep abreast of future intent and direction of the industry and the technical innovation it wishes to introduce and the need then for us to adapt our own approaches or the framework. What I would say is there is still work to do for us. There's recognition of the need for ONR to improve and modernise, to ensure that we are fit to regulate for the future. Much work has been done on it, again, some of the stuff was highlighted by Adiren about the ONR Academy, making sure that we train our people to have the right cultural approach, uh, right decision making, right thought processes and such like, and the WIRED project where we're looking at knowledge management and the provision of effective and efficient business processes. Recent evidence of our ability to change and do it well and effectively is our work on SIAPS and the move to a goal setting regime for security but also what we've achieved in establishing a safeguards function for the UK. We will continue to ensure greater integration and consistency across all of our regulatory purpose to realise the benefits from the improved ways of working that this will influence. All the work that we are currently pursuing is developing and embedding our approach to ensure that we properly consider the economic impact of regulation decisions that we make. This will be a key feature in our processes in the future and it will have a significant bearing on how we consider innovation. But again, it will require a cultural shift within our organisation. Continued safety and security remain paramount, 
but we do have a duty to ensure that we consider all relevant factors, including whether the same outcomes can be achieved for less and whether a novel approach is more suitable. So a, a few examples now around being enabling uh, and being accessible. This one highlights Sellafield, the breakthrough strategy there where we worked and established really the enabling approach as it's known today. It's paying dividends as I've highlighted. Uh, it's focusing on providing and delivering accelerated risk and hazard reduction on the site. Uh, the groundbreaking G6 approach that we uh, uh, have established and gives good accessibility to regulators at the right level with the right people around the table. It's been so successful that it's been adopted in other areas of our work with you, the industry, exotics. More recently at Devonport, they've agreed now that uh, it'd be good to have that type of approach adopted. And then other things in the pipeline is the renewal of the enabling regulation guide. In that, we are going to make sure that we have specific reference to how we consider innovation and also how we consider the economic impact of regulation. And I've already mentioned uh, the ONR Academy and how it's going to further embed our supportive approach. Collaboration, very, very important, both with uh, UK uh, organisations, licensees and duty holders, but also in the context of, of international collaboration as highlighted on the slide here. Uh, across the various agencies that we work with quite closely, the International Atomic Energy Agency and the Nuclear Energy Agency in Paris, but also through our bilateral exchanges and such like. It's important for us to learn and keep up to date with what our fellow national regulators are doing. The challenges presented by their industries and how they may translate to the UK and to realise the opportunities of collaboration to best effect. There's the option to develop common standards. CNSC and NRC, the American regulator, do have greater alignment with regards to some of the work that they are currently undertaking and are forging a path with regards to cooperating on looking to establishing common ways of going forward on SMR assessment. But we are keeping engaged with that and hopefully we will have the opportunity to become properly engaged as the UK moves towards an advanced nuclear technology deployment. Being adaptable. What I would say in terms of being adaptable is looking at uh, other opportunities outside the norm. One particular example there, halfway down that page, is engagement with potential size well see investors uh, to articulate the safety benefits uh, uh, of, of replication. So I know members of my team met with uh, uh, venture capital investors uh, along with, with Bayes and such like, and set out what the regulatory approach is in the UK. It gave clarity in areas where they had a lack of knowledge, but what that did was reduce their concern with regards, with regards to regulatory risk. And as a consequence, a number of them indicated a significant improvement in their willingness to invest in a new bill programme in the UK. Now, for a small level of investment on our part, will potentially reap great rewards for the nuclear industry. And horizon scanning, very important uh, for us as a regulator and for yourselves as an industry. We need to make sure that we protect against being insular as an industry and we need to look outwards to other sectors of UK industry and industry globally. Uh, again, working with the NIC, the NIA, industry itself. I've also got my own independent uh, advisory panel that was as mentioned on the video uh, previously by Jill. Uh, where I try and get some alternative advice than that would normally be provided by my own internal expertise, knowledge and such like, and people within the industry. It's made up of individuals from academia and now uh, members of the NGO community as well, and they provide me with advice on topics that I believe are relevant at this moment in time. Also cooperation with the Nuclear Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre and NNL as well with regards to what may be coming forward with regards to solutions for the industry. There's also a significant focus, what I would highlight now, 
from the international community, international regulatory community on innovation and what it means for us as regulators. Uh, I know Canada had an event uh, just a few weeks ago and there's an event next week in, in uh, Korea that uh, uh, um, Mike Finity, my Deputy Chief Inspector, is going to attend to make sure that we are aware of and contribute to all the discussions around innovation from a regulatory context. The owner has helped the project develop improved and faster solutions. It's helped understand the breadth and boundaries of the regulations and how to develop solutions that otherwise we might not have achieved. One example of that was the use of intumescent paint, where we're developing a new package design. Normally that would have taken years to develop, but we've shaved off months, maybe years, and developed a solution that we perhaps wouldn't have achieved if we'd applied normal approaches. The key to the success of this project was early engagement with the licensees on some of the proposals for innovative solutions to technical problems that arose. Um, I think it, the, the message is to the licensees not to assume that we would not consider any reasonable arguments. The use of intumescent coating uh, challenged established norms. It's an application that is used in other industries, such as aviation. We listened to the arguments for its use and accepted it, and we think it's a first of a kind for such an application to radioactive materials transport. So just a few slides to sum up now. What I would highlight is that innovation is not new for ONR, but it continues to be a challenge, both for industry and ourselves, to establish some meaningful thinking about innovation and what it means to us all, and how such opportunities in respect of innovation can be grasped and pressed forward. I think it's right that we take this opportunity for a sense check by regulators, industry, government and wider stakeholders here now and what the future arrangements will be going forward. Or in our strategy, what I would say is not sufficiently developed and aligned to support future innovation. That is why I've started the work stream around ONR's innovation plan. But what I would say, stealing some of Adrienne's word is, we're up for it. Uh, and it will feature very, very clearly in our 2025 strategy that uh, we will be working on uh, in the coming months and also there will be a bit of a discussion uh, shortly during the course of today. Are we proactively engaging? What I would say is we are starting on the journey with regards to um, uh, innovation. You, predominantly uh, a number of our uh, licensees, but at my independent advisory panel, we did discuss innovation, and one of the indications that it gave there was perhaps we need to get out into the supply chain a much wider a field to make sure that that supply chain is aware of our openness with regards to novel technological solutions and such like. We will do that and seek every opportunity to make sure that we can realise those opportunities, because by engaging with the supply chain, it means they are much more likely to come forward with um, new novel solutions than they would otherwise have been because of the perception that we as a regulator would not accept anything out of the ordinary. But again, we recognise it's just not technological solutions that may be coming to the fore. It may be associated with financing, scheduling. What I would say is about doing things differently and hence thinking differently as a regulator and as the industry. Many innovations are the simplest. Last week I went up to Barrow with uh, my new chair, Mark, and a really simple innovation. In constructing the submarines, uh, they have to erect uh, and then drop scaffolding many, many occasions. Um, costs them thousands of pounds, and some of it is quite an intricate piece of scaffolding to do a weld on a pressure hold uh, segment. They do that weld, drop it, move it along. It's saving them thousands and thousands of pounds by putting wheels on the bottom of the scaffolding. It's not the zip stuff that you see for your window cleaner using as it goes around your house. This is proper industrial um, scaffolding where they have wheels on the bottom and the welders themselves can move it. So they do the weld over the space of a couple of days, move it around and do the next weld. That would have taken days and weeks to complete that whole section. By putting wheels on the scaffolding, they are doing it in a much more effective and efficient way. And another initiative that they actually uh, have brought in is called TINA. And TINA stands for, this is not astute. 
And by introducing that thought process, they are start trying to instill a cultural shift in thinking across the enterprise. Because astute is the current class of submarine hunter killer that's been constructed and gone through the whole uh, procurement, design, etc. process. And the idea is that you bring in novel thinking. You start to think laterally about what your solution is. So the norms for astute are not the norms for the future. Hopefully, I provided confidence that we are up for innovation. And this is a slide that identifies a few things that we can expect from us as a regulator. Being open and transparent, but also being supportive. Being flexible and adaptable, but clear on what our expectations are and what our red lines are. But we will be receptive to constructive challenge. I expect all of my inspectors to welcome challenge and be able to have a constructive argument with anyone or discussion with regards to any particular uh, technical issue. But we'll also engage early, including engaging with the supply chain. And we will continue to remain open-minded and not fixed or blinkered in our thinking. We also need to make sure that we proactively horizon scan and we're already starting to undertake some additional initiatives that allow us to do that. But we will seek to be innovative as a regulator and it will require some deep thinking for us. But most of all, we will continue to work collaboratively. Just as a final reminder then, innovation itself is not an issue or a problem. It can actually enhance safety and or security. The challenge arises from when the extent innovation departs from the norm, the normal accepted practices. What was considered in creating the regulatory framework will have to be reconsidered. But all need to work together to ensure the benefits of innovation are achieved looking to minimise regulatory uncertainty around that innovation. But what I would say is that the framework that we work within can be adapted. We need to recognise also that introducing innovation involves a degree of risk. It will require us potentially to revise our approach, different ways of regulating to gain the necessary assurances on safety and security. Being innovative ourselves and I welcome any suggestions and challenges that you may have with regards to how we can improve. I'd like to have discussions with you at lunch if you've got any ideas where you think uh, there's room for innovation with ourselves, which we can consider in our own innovation plan. What I would say is, as a final message, we are open and capable of change to support innovation taken forward by yourselves, but to be innovative ourselves as a regulator. Please continue to work with us as we will continue to work with you. Thank you.